Well, good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. I'm, I'm uh, getting over a little cold, so my voice is a little uh, scratchy. So, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. But anyway, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about something a little, a little interesting today, and that is uh, superposition and hybridization of atomic orbitals. And if you remember from uh, some videos that I did uh, about a year or so ago on um, a visualization of orbitals, I used a program known as Atom in a Box on the uh, iPad <coughs> and uh, showed you uh, how we uh, can look at wave function uh, solutions or an interpretation of wave function solutions. Um, and that in interpretation, when we talk about uh, wave functions uh, that uh, describe electrons, in hydrogen-like uh, atoms, uh, we got a kind of some interesting shapes of probability density. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take that concept just a step further now and really um, kind of show you how treating the electron as a wave can be really helpful. I'm only going to give one example today, but it's a really good example, and it has been a, a really helpful example, and it's kind of the foundation uh, for understanding or the, for the fundamental understanding of organic chemistry. So it should be kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just I'm going to pull up a little uh, keynote that I made uh, real quick and I'll give you kind of some introductory information. Okay, so here we go. Um, we talk about wave function, superposition, and orbital hybridization. So what we need to do is we need to kind of understand a little bit about the intuition of superposition. And superposition is a kind of an interesting thing, and it, it, it it's something that's uh, that can be explained or can pertain to wave phenomena. And rather than try to give you all the technical definitions, uh, let's just kind of do some visualization and kind of develop somewhat of an intuition for, for what I'm really talking about when I'm talking about superposition. Uh, so if we look at waves, we have actually what are called interference. Uh, when waves can interfere with one another, I have something called destructive interference, constructive interference, and then you can even have a combination thereof. So let's just take a look at destructive interference. Uh, so if you look over here on the left, what I do, I have two different wave, we'll call these wave packets. Okay, so I have a wave packet here, and it has a positive amplitude, and it is moving in this direction, and coming toward it, I have another wave packet uh, with a negative amplitude. And we can assume that these waves are pretty much the same in any other way, every other way, except that the sign of the amplitude is, is opposite. And when these two waves, as this one is moving this way and this one is moving this way, when the two waves meet, um, they will have um, opposite, opposite sign and they will be what we call out of phase. They are perfectly 100% out of phase. So when these two waves meet out of phase and we put them in, in, in a sort of superposition, uh, what are we going to get? Well, they're basically going to cancel each other out. Um, positive here, negative here, they meet at exactly the same point. And they're going to cancel each other out into more or less a flat line if they're perfectly um, out of phase. And another type of interference is something known as constructive interference. So here I have a wave packet here and a wave packet here. Okay, I, 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 This kind of goes below the baseline and it kind of looks like they're connected. But let's just kind of pretend that they're two different little wave packets. And they're moving toward each other. This one moving in this direction. This one moving in this direction. And when they meet, they will be perfectly in phase. And that is to say that the peaks um, are going to meet on top of each other. And what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get something called constructive interference some, uh, at the, the end product, if you will. When I add those two together will be a wave packet that is much larger um, than the two because they're basically able to add and constructively interfere with one another versus uh, destructive interference. And perhaps an example of destructive interference is something called uh, noise canceling. Cancellation, you've heard of noise canceling headphones. Noise canceling headphones work on 
uh, using this destructive interference principle where um, you can produce uh, other waves that are out of sign with some of the background noise and cancel some of that out through destructive interference. And then we can also put them, them together. So let's just assume that maybe this is a, a wave function for some sort of particle. Maybe it's, it's an electron <clears throat> in some sort of state. And then down here I have another wave function uh, for another, uh, you will just say electrons in some sort of state, okay? <clears throat> um, so here you can see I have positive amplitude, negative amplitude, and a little positive amplitude here. Here I have negative, positive, negative, positive, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these two together, okay, I'm, and we're going to see what happens. Well, if we add them together, um, you can see that I have um, a positive amplitude here and a negative amplitude here, so um, but this this negative part isn't quite as big as all the positive. Uh, so when these two come to, so when these two packets come together, these parts are more or less going to destructively interfere, whereas these this part here and this part here are in phase, uh, as well as this part and this part. So I should expect constructive interference here and here. So the finished. So when I want to go ahead and put these into a superposition, I interfere them, uh, I get something that looks like this. I have um, a destructive interference, so these two have come together, destructively interfered, and what's basically left of that one, if you want to look at it that way, is right here. These two have constructively interfered, so it's bigger, and then these two have constructively interfered, so I have a totally different um, you know, wave function, if you will. I have basically... Um, taken these two and I've taken a um, more than likely what we call linear combination um, added, added them up I've added these two wave functions to produce a completely different uh, wave function um, out of these two <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of interesting but how does that apply to the the original uh, question well let's talk about electron electrons specifically let's talk about carbon and let's talk about the electronic configuration of carbon. So uh, carbon has six electrons, and, it had, and its electrons are spread out between two uh, uh, principal quantum numbers, principal energy levels. And here is the complete electronic configuration for carbon. It's uh, 1s2. So there are two electrons in the 1s, uh, the first shell, uh, which only has an s orbital but I am more interested in the valence electrons which are right here. These are the valence electrons. Um, you can see the 2s2 and the 2p2, the second shell, contains the valence electrons. Uh, the first shell contains core electrons and we're not as, as concerned of those because the valence electrons are involved in chemical bonding. So I have 2s2, 2p2. So I have a uh, four electrons in the valence shell, but here's the interesting thing. I have two electrons in the 2s orbital and two electrons in the 2p orbital. Well, we know that in poly, uh, polyelectronic atoms, um, the s orbitals uh, have probability density that's closer to the nucleus. The s orbital can penetrate closer to the nucleus. So, the s orbital in carbon is going to be at a lower energy versus the p orbitals um, which get screened somewhat compared to the s orbitals and the bottom line is that the s and the p orbitals are at different energy levels they're no longer degenerate in carbon so when we talk about uh, chemical bonding with carbon i should expect uh, bonds at different angles when carbon bonds to other atoms I should expect it to bond at different angles, and the, the, the general average bond length should be different between the S and the P, because we're talking about different energies. However, we know that when we look at a one of the most basic um, carbon mo molecules of carbon, CH4 or methane, uh, methane has a total of four bonds. Okay, well, that's all right, because, uh, you know, I do have... Um, four electrons here, um, the 2s orbital is full, so I really shouldn't get any bonding here, so really most of my bonding should be in the p orbitals because they're not not full, 
um, and I know that I have three p orbitals, so I should get three bonds instead of four bonds, and each of the bonds in the CH4, the methane uh, molecule, have an equal angle of 109.5 degrees. This is very strange because I should have different bond angles, different lengths, and probably uh, only three bonds because I only have three p orbitals to work with. And um, I really, why am I getting four bonds? Why are the bond angle all the same? Well, maybe um, I could take uh, an electron out of the s orbital and put it into the p orbital, but that would mean um, that I'd have to promote this electron down here at low energy in the s orbital, and I'd have to promote it to higher energy. And you know, I'm not sure that I'd want to do that very easily. So there's something really weird going on here, and we can't really explain it conventionally. But what we can do is we can explain it um, if we take the wave functions that describe these orbitals and we combine them. We put them into a, in a superposition. I take the s orbital and the p orbital and what I can do is I know that I have three p orbitals and one s orbital and what I can do is I can combine, combine the, the s orbital and the p orbitals so I have one s and three p's um, in the second energy level, the second shell. Uh, I can combine all four of those and I can make what are called hybrid orbitals and if I combine one P or one S, excuse me, and three P's and put it all into a blender, a quantum blender, mix it all up, out pops what we call hybrid orbitals or four different hybrid or orbitals that are a, in a superposition of S and P. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to show you kind of what, what that looks like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up um, Adam in a Box, but I'm actually going to pull up the um, Adam in a Box on um, my, my computer here. And I can actually do a couple of different things with it that I couldn't do on the iPad. So let's go ahead and open up Adam in the Box here. And um, I'm just going to change it just a little bit. Uh, show the phase as a color, and we'll go ahead and uh, there we go. And <clears throat> give you a full screen here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the little superposition function here, and what I'm going to do is I have this is psi, so this is my wave function, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a 2p wave function and a 2s wave function, okay? So I'm gonna make, make them all the same, first of all. We'll start out the same. Obviously, I can't do that. Uh, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0. Um, the Pauli exclusion principle doesn't allow that. But let's go ahead and um, do a 2p. So my n quantum number is going to be 2, okay, or second shell, and L, is going to be 1, and then I'm just going to keep m sub l 0. Okay, so 2, 1, 0 gives me a 2p orbital. Okay, then I'm going to add to that a 2, 0, 0. Okay, I'm going to put both of these into superposition, and then let's see what I get here. Hopefully you can see that okay. So what I've done is I've added a 2, 1, 0, a 2p plus a 2s orbital, and I get a hybridized orbital from that, okay? And you can see what has happened. Um, I have had um, an area right here at the top, you can see, where um, the lobe is very large. I have a large amount of probability density. This is where I've had, um, this is where I've had constructive interference, Okay, and then here, this smaller lobe here, is where I've had destructive interference. Um, so I kind of get something that looks a little like an S and a little like a P, but not like both because I've had constructive and destructive interference occurring um, where the wave function for the 2S and 2P orbitals 
uh, wave functions were either um, in phase or out of phase. And then in the case of methane, I can have four different hybrid orbitals. I can have four of these orbitals, and these orbitals can all um, have the same angle of, of 109.5. They're all at the same energy, um, and they all produce the same bond length. And that is just one of the ways that we can use the wave-like characteristics of, um, of the electron. Um, and we can make use of uh, the superposition principle to make these hybrid orbitals, to make uh, uh, predictions in, in terms of chemical bonding that we wouldn't be able to make if we simply looked at the electron as um, perhaps simply just a particle. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's kind of an interesting video, and I just kind of wanted to show you um, some, some other neat stuff. So, as always, thanks for hanging in there.